The Fairhaven John Doe, identified as Keith Olson. This one begins in Fairhaven, Massachusetts on April 8, 1985. It was then that a driver traveling on Interstate 195, who would make a discovery that was likely the difference between a man getting back his name or not ever being found. Discoveries like this from long patches of highway where people generally don't get out of their cars, as odd as it sounds to say they're lucky, in this case, it probably really was. Because as this driver got out of their car, they happened to catch a human skeleton about 45 feet from the roadway. He traveled into town, found a phone, and called the police. Those remains would be forwarded on to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. They would conclude that he was a white man who'd had his life taken a few years before he was found. If I could lean into the luck of this just a little bit again for just a moment, he wasn't scattered. And because so much was left intact, they found what they described as trauma, and it was determined that someone had done this to him. Another article describes what was found as several spent projectives. They did a facial reconstruction, and they placed him likely in his 30s to 40s, and they even found some remnants of clothing. The reconstruction was done on the local news, and they did get some tips, but nothing ever panned out. Additionally, they pulled dental records from all around the area, but there was no match. But this always goes back to the whole touchy thing about comparing it with records of those who've been reported missing. And those are the only dental charts that they compared. But you had a system in place that often didn't allow you to report someone missing. Any missing adult, without proof of something else having happened, chose to walk away. And so that really tips the balance against a lot of the does being identified, too, because now so much time has passed, and some even were reported missing, and over time, those records were lost. So as far as our databases now, there's a problem also. So the police did what they could to try to identify our John Doe here, but with little to go on, it eventually just turned cold, and that was pretty much it. That is, until the Bristol County District Attorney would go ahead and launch the Unidentified Bodies Project. This would lead to them enlisting Othram Labs, who was able to generate his DNA, eventually landing on a family tree for a missing man from Cranston, Rhode Island. Cranston is about 35 miles or 56 kilometers away from where he was found in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. So it was pretty close. We know now that Keith Olson disappeared four years earlier in April of 1981. Keith had been dating a woman who had previously dated a man who had ties to the mafia. Keith was seen leaving his home with two unidentified men the night he vanished, and that was it. There was no word from him again. His family long believed that Keith's life was taken, and it had to do with his girlfriend's ex-boyfriend. His family had come to the sad conclusion that Keith would never be found. And of course he almost wasn't, if not for the eagle eye of a passerby. His family would lovingly describe Keith as being protective and loyal, a man who has gone too soon, saying that he has never, even for a moment, left their hearts and minds. His being found and identified means so much to them and that they would forever love him. They made the statement, they have brought Keith's remains home to us so that he may finally be laid to rest and finally have the peace that he deserves. No family should ever have to endure this long and painful anguish of not knowing what happened to their son or their brother their Keith. Keith Olson went unidentified for 38 years, 11 years longer than he got to spend on this earth. Had he been allowed to live the life he should have, he would be 65 years old today. The Sedgwick County John Doe, identified as Harold James Crawford. This story begins on October 29, 1994, in Sedgwick County, Kansas which is in the rural part of a county that includes the town of Wichita. This county has about half a million people in it. So while this was rural, it was still a pretty populated area. In this case, KG and E workers were out doing routine service at an intersection near 47th Street South and Hoover. And this area is not highly populated at all. It was here that they found remains of a man who had likely been there six months or longer. He'd been wrapped up in what is described as debris. They thought he probably wasn't very old, maybe 22 to 29, and around 5 foot 8 and 160 pounds or 173 centimeters and 73 kilograms. His hair was somewhere between auburn brown to a sandy blonde. He had teeth that were nearly perfect, 
other than a front tooth that had been pulled at a young age. He had no cavities or dental work at all. He was wearing khaki shorts and a purple Bugle Boy long-sleeved shirt. He was wrapped in blankets, a waterbed pad, and some sheets. There were other towels and sheets found nearby. Recreations were done and run on the news in hopes of identifying the man, but no matter what they did, the Sedgwick County Sheriff would find themselves at a point after multiple tries and reconstructions where all that was left to do was apply for a grant to take advantage of genetic genealogy. And this is where Othram Labs, once again, comes in. This eventually led to the name of a man missing from the same general area, Harold James Crawford, who was only 21 years old when he went missing from Wichita, Kansas. I manipulated this photo a little bit, but with full disclosure, it's pretty obviously an arrest photo. James was younger here, I think, and just from the look on his face, it seems like James was struggling. He was reported missing, but someone brought information forward saying he left of his own accord and that missing person report was vacated, which may have very well kept him from being identified. His family missed him. His sister was a mom with three young kids at the time and even remembered seeing the sketch shown on TV. She said she considered that the sketch looked a lot like her brother but dismissed it because the man in the photo was too old to be James, saying the resemblance was enough that it did make her think for a moment and then, of course, remember it now. And unfortunately now, she says she would forever be sorry for dismissing it as impossible. But the truth is, it's not her fault. Everybody just did the best that they could. And it's pretty common in a lot of these cases. Usually people don't jump to the idea that something permanent had happened. His sister would describe James as cool, saying her heart is broken. She had long believed he had moved on and was married somewhere. And it's shocking to find out he was gone all of that time. She said she looked for him on and off all of these years, and somebody had actually told her that James was married and sick of his dysfunctional family. I do wish I knew who said that, but it's not been given. But the story he left of his own accord, the story he was married, it spread through town and she believed it and she thought she was respecting his wishes by giving him space. His COD has never been released. However, it's clear this was not an accident. So they need someone to come forward, and James's sister is desperate to find answers, saying she needs to know who did this, how someone could roll him up in a blanket and throw him in the dirt, is unfathomable to her. He was 21 and living on the east side of Wichita. I've provided the number for Crime Stoppers. Anyone with any information can do this without giving their name. James Crawford went unidentified for 29 years. Had he lived, he would be 50 years old today. The Buffalo Jane Doe, 1988, identified as Sonia Yvette Archie. This story begins on March 25, 1989, in Buffalo, New York, where skeletal remains were found of a woman who was probably around 20 to 25 years old, possibly white or Hispanic, and she may have been Native American or Alaskan Native. She was around 100 pounds and 5 foot 2 or 45 kilograms and 158 centimeters. Some pretty different recreations were done, but in reality, they were as different from each other as the woman they were meant to depict. She had been wearing a light blue and gray top in a size small, as well as a cotton and polyester sweatsuit. She also had on white thermal underwear, and they knew she had dark, curly, shoulder-length brown hair. So now they need to know more about her life. Sonia Yvette Archie was just 26 years old, a black woman who was from Buffalo, New York. She was found in the same city she went missing about seven months later. It's likely the guess about her race is the reason that Sonia went unidentified for so many years. Although I feel like I should say, it's pretty amazing that the majority of the time, they do get the race correct. It just depends on a number of factors, and I imagine the knowledge and ability of an anthropologist, if available, Sonia's COD hasn't been released, but they do know it was foul play. So anyone with information is needed to call. Sonia Yvette Archie went unidentified for 34 years. Had she lived the life she deserved, she would be 60 years old today. Thank you everyone so much for watching and listening. If you aren't subscribed, please take a moment to do so, hitting the bell so you are notified of new videos. And thank you all for leaving comments and emojis to help with engagement, as well as hitting the like button. Take care of yourselves and each other.